afternoon everyone and thank you for logging in our uh, weekly teaching sessions uh, just because uh, dr ishi is a guest today and i think we i just wanted to give a brief so dr ishi this is basically you know um, uh, i would say one of the uh, uh, requirements the covid had put on us so there were no physical meeting so we thought we'll start something for our fellows in fact and we in fact named it also pho online teaching for the fellows uh, but it eventually kind of you know um became a teaching for all of us and uh, we have been having these sessions every week uh, for the last few months um they are very well appreciated and um, we try to log in all of us uh, what we usually do is that we usually uh, take a disease and uh, you know um uh, have a didactic for 15 20 minutes 30 minutes and then have a case discussion which is moderated by one of the senior colleagues with some experts in the field and the fellows present the cases that's a usual format uh neeta had this idea she said you know why don't we uh, um get some uh, you know um uh, uh, some seminars and some uh, you know uh, um people like yourself who can you know at least uh, give a perspective um on some of these important topics and uh, so i we thank you for uh, first of all for accepting our invitation um at this odd hour i would say you know we know it's, it's very inconvenient for you to wake up at 4 am in the morning and uh, be speaking to us and I, we 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 got to appreciate that um so i take this uh, opportunity to introduce dr ashish uh, most of us you know know you well and uh, you know but for the sake of all the um junior colleagues who must have not known you or heard him before uh, dr ashish is basically uh, alumni of um, um, i think lokmanya tilak uh, from 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 bombay uh, and uh, further on went to have uh, uh, his speed hemong training and bono transfer uh, transfer fellowship uh, from the us and he they very had his uh, phd as well um dr ashish currently is uh, the professor uh, in bone marrow transplant and immunodeficiency at the department of pediatrics at cincinnati children's um and he also is the director of the fellowship program there um and also director of the lch uh, center and which we all know that uh, is one of the um, <clears throat> leading centers not only in hemong but also the work in lch and the contribution made in the lch field uh, from that center um so dr ashish you know um if i uh, kind of um, speak about you it will take me long time um lot of you know um, it's it's a, it's a illustrious career and we you know we really um um kind of look up to you um uh, you know more than 50 60 i mean good period publication then you know you have been mentoring lot of students including the phd students so um so uh, vast experience in the field um so none better than you could talk to us on lch and uh, dr ashish is going to be uh, discussing with us what is what is current and what's uh, the new in lch field and what, where the research is heading up in lch uh, um i also take uh, uh, opportunity to in, to welcome uh, dr mamta manglani ma'am who uh, is our uh, president of the pho society at the moment um, um good evening ma'am Thank you. Um, over to you, Dr. Ashish. Uh, and uh, we usually uh, will ask, you know, students, fellows, and others who have logged in to put some questions, and they can raise their hands also or ask, or they can put in the chat box, and then we can take them end of the session. Thank you very much, and and over to you, Dr. Ashish. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, is my microphone working? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yeah. it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can't tell you how honored. um and humbled i am to be talking in front of dr manglani i'm a little nervous now because she was my professor when i was a medical student um, um so i hope i don't stumble do i look old enough well <laughs> the question no, no you, actually no, you, you look the same you my colleague <laughs> <laughs> you look the same as we as 30 years ago thank you okay so um let me just briefly um I have to disclose this. I have done uh, some consulting work for a small pharmaceutical company called Sobe. Um, but most important, I find lectures boring, and so especially for the students, um, if uh, you have questions, please interrupt and ask. Let's have a discussion. That is more important than what I have to say here. Um, I am uh, leading the. It used to be called the LCH Center, but we are in the process of changing the name, calling it the Histiocytosis Center. Uh, and part of uh, besides me part of the center we now have one of the world's uh, best pathologists in histiocytosis dr jennifer pikarsik uh, some of you may be familiar with the work of dr michael jordan 
Um, he is um, leading the work in HLH. Uh, he and I together take care of both of the histiocytic disorders, LCH, HLH, and one of our junior colleague, colleague is Dr. Adam Nelson. I'm going to start by giving you some stories. Uh, these are real patients of ours uh, that led us to where we are today. Um, so please bear with me and students if you can keep along <laughs> um, because I'm going to tell you the stories of four different patients. And the first patient is a six month old boy who had a rash in his armpits and groin for a few weeks. And then he stopped eating and his mother saw something in his mouth. And on physical exam, he had a pale swelling or a mass jetting down from his hard palate. And so when we obtained a CT scan, you can see here, um, this is this uh, hard mass, actually it was on both sides, but the left side was more prominent. The second patient is an 11 year old girl who developed pain and swelling around the left eye. And she had an MRI, which I'm showing here. And there was a mass that was surgically removed. The pathology suggested it to be osteomyelitis for which she was treated with IV antibiotics. Unfortunately, three months later, she had a new pain this time in her buttocks. Um, and uh, another MRI and this time showed a lesion in the coccyx. Patient number three is a four month old who initially presented with a skin rash, uh, but it was just a rash so nothing was done. And then several months later, she developed persistent fevers. And then when they did a chest X-ray because she was so tiny, her skull was included in the X-ray and they found she had a lytic lesion. So based on the rash and the lytic lesion, they thought she might have this disease that we're talking about and she was treated with vinblastin and prednisone. But in spite of that, the fever persisted. Blood cultures were negative, but in spite of several days of IV antibiotics, her fever persisted. She eventually developed pancytopenia. Her neutrophil count was zero. Platelet count was at single digits, 8,000. And whenever the hemoglobin and platelet are the same, you know that you're in serious trouble because hemoglobin was also quite low. She was noted to have massive hepatosplenomegaly. A bone marrow biopsy was performed, which was full of histiocytes, um, which were actively um, uh, causing hemophagocytosis. That led them to wonder if this is the disorder, the other H disorder that we are familiar with. And she was found to have a very high ferritin, a low fibrinogen, and an elevated uh, soluble CD25 or the soluble AL2 receptor alpha. And so this is a picture of her bone marrow biopsy. And on the left is a low power V. As you can see, there's almost no normal hematopoietic elements. All you see are sheets of these large um, histiocyte looking cells. And if you zoom in, you can see this one histiocyte has eaten several red blood cells and a few other cells. And here's another one in its belly has lots of red blood cells and remnants of other cells. So the question is, is this HLH or hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis? I am assuming most of you are familiar with this disorder, which is an immune deficiency, which is most common in young children, manifests with fever, cytopenia, and splenomegaly. And you see hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow. You have elevated ferritin, low fibrinogen, soluble ion receptor is also elevated. So with all these features, this infant was diagnosed as having HLH. And the standard treatment for HLH is decadron and etoposide for which she was treated. But in spite of that, she had no response. The fever and pancytopenia persisted. HLH, especially in infants, is a genetic disorder. So she had genetic testing, which was negative. And at that point, she was transferred to us uh, because we are an HLH center of, of excellence and we had a clinical trial for a new therapy that was going, that had just initiated at that time. But when she arrived, she still had this eczematous rash. And so, which is why we questioned, is this really HLH? Because the rash and the skull bony lesion is not usually seen in HLH. So we did a PET scan. And of course, we knew that she had a massive hepatosplenomegaly. I have, with the arrows pointed out, her liver is almost touching her iliac crest on the right, and her spleen is close to the iliac crest on the left. But the entire skeletal system had the diffuse uptake. And we have since seen several other infants identical to this one. And here are the PET scans of four of such infants. This is the first one that I presented shortly after this one, a month later came this child. Um, also, you can see the entire skeletal system lights up. This child has 
um, massive um, liver and spleen enlargement and a very high uptake in the thymus, lymphadenopathy and bony lesions in the skull. This child also has hepatosplenomegaly and uh, uptake in all the bones. And finally, patient number four is a two-year-old boy who developed diabetes insipidus. It's a, I'll take a small tangent to tell you uh, the origins of the words diabetes, meaning a siphon, that means water runs through it, and insipid, meaning tasteless, as opposed to mellitus, which is sweet as honey. So back in the 19th century, this is how physicians would diagnose whether the patient has diabetes mellitus or diabetes insipidus by tasting the patient's urine. Thank God we don't live in that era anymore. Okay, so patient number four who developed diabetes insipidus at the age of two was found to have nothing else that could explain it. So no other treatment was offered besides the uh, desmopressin replacement. Uh, at the age of four, he was diagnosed with growth hormone deficiency. At the age of 10, he was initially thought to have um, depression, but was later diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome because he was not doing well in school. And he continued to have progressive problems with the academics and also then developed ataxia, challenges with balance and coordination. And at age of 16, when his family moved to Cincinnati, we obtained an MRI of his brain. And on the left, I show you a normal MRI. On the right is our patient's MRI. And you can see his cerebellum has undergone significant atrophy. All of these patients that I've just described suffer from the same disease, and that is LCH, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, in which there's accumulation of clonal cells that look like normal Langerhans cells. Langerhans cells, if you recall, are antigen-presenting cells normally found in the skin, mucosa, maybe even, even the lymph nodes. They are related to this family of myeloid dendritic cells originally derived from monocytes. Langerhans cells are not the same as the Langerhans giant cell or the islands of Langerhans. They just happen to be described by the same individual. And the disease LCH has nothing to do with the disease HLH. They're completely different, different biologies. They just share the same last word, last letter. LCH was formerly also known as, by these names, um, the, when I was a student, it was known as histiocytosis X, um, hence the title that I chose. Um, but we have now decided that we were going to call it LCH. Um, it is a rare childhood disease. Majority of patients uh, present between the ages of birth to 15 years. The peak incidence is between one and three years. At least in Western countries, the incidence is supposed to be about one in 200,000, which is similar to AML or Hodgkin's lymphoma in young children, but there may be many others that go undiagnosed. It also occurs in adults, but it's much less common. But again, it is thought to be one to two per million, but we don't know. The manifestations are extremely heterogeneous, as have you noticed in the patients that I presented. It can be in a single asymptomatic bony lesion to multi-organ disease involving the liver, spleen, bone marrow, the lungs, and the central nervous system. Of the presentations, um, the bony presentation is the most common found in up to 80% of patients. Uh, the second most common is the skin and then the, the rest of the uh, organ systems decline in frequency. Uh, in, uh, interestingly, 15% of patients will develop diabetes insipidus. Up to 20% are initially diagnosed as having chronic otitis media. Well, we know it is not an infectious otitis. Uh, involvement of the GI tract is extremely rare, but it has been seen. Under the microscope, this is what a biopsy of the lesion looks like. It is full of these large cells, which are histiocytes, which have the classic folded coffee bean-shaped nucleus, and scattered are eosinophils um, in this lesion. It is, the hallmark is the positivity of this uh, stain called CD1A. So this is how the diagnosis is established. And if you noticed, there are many pockets of cells in here that are CD1A negative. And that's because uh, the LCH cells attract other inflammatory cells, which fill up the lesion as well. It can happen in adults too, like I mentioned. I'll give you one example of this 36 year old woman whose first manifestation again was central diabetes insipidus. 
And in adults, uh, it is usually a brain tumor or rarely sarcoidosis, but none of, none of that was seen, so no treatment was offered. Over the next several years, she developed, she had gradual cognitive decline and then developed uh, seizures and was finally noted to have these large masses, almost tennis ball sized, one in her neck and one in her groin area. And so a PET scan was obtained and I'm showing you, here's the mass on the left side of her neck and here's the one in the left side of her groin. Um, the disease is stratified as either single system and the single system is particularly if it's a bone, it can have a solitary bone lesion or multifocal bone. You can have a single site, but it's in a special location. Or you can have multi-system disease that can involve a risk organ, which is the hematopoietic system, a spleen or liver, or without a risk organ. Or you can have a single bony lesion that puts you at risk for CNS disease. This is how we currently classify it. And there's a rationale for this classification. Um, and I'll tell you that in a second. Uh, the solitary bony lesion is the most common with the skull being the most common location. The funny thing is that uh, this can undergo spontaneous regression, which is why I suspect that this disease may be more common than what we think, because you can imagine many children have this bump on the head. They think that they hit the head on something. The pain lasts for a few days to a few weeks, and then it spontaneously, this swelling spontaneously disappears. And so whether or not to treat this depends on uh, what happens. Many times, by the time the children come to us, the lesion is already starting to shrink. And one can even say that if it is already leave, healing, then let it be, leave it alone. If it is small, uh, two centimeters or less, it can be surgically excised. If it is big, like five centimeters, then we argue against surgical excision because that can be more harmful and not just in the skull, but anywhere else. For lesions that fall somewhere between two to five centimeters, one can do a curatage with intralesional steroids. That is what is the current practice. But honestly, I will tell you, I think leaving it alone many times works just fine. Here's another example, a 16 year old male who had this large lesion in the right side of his pelvis. It was initially thought to be Ewing sarcoma because of his age and the location. But when a biopsy was performed, it was LCH and uh, we chose to leave it alone. So this is his PET scan. You can see a very active hole in his, um, in his ilium right here. And six weeks later, the PET activity has completely disappeared and the hole is already beginning to shrink in size. And another um, X-ray obtained six months later showed there was nothing left there. So it's spontaneously resolved. Now, if it's in a special location, even it may be a single bony site, this is a seven-year-old child who had pain in her neck. And you can see this is the uh, second cervical vertebral process. And here's the uh, FDG uptake on the PET scan. And if you look at the MRI, the lesion is encroaching right here up to the odontoid process. And this is a very dangerous location because if this bone were to break, you can imagine she will die. So this is a what's called a special site. Um, this is a child who initially came to us with just a lump above her left ear. And I was thinking this will be a solitary uh, lesion of LCH. But when we did a PET scan, she actually had one lesion in her mandible and several lesions in her vertebral spine and also several in her femur. And these were all unfortunately painless at this stage. But she's also three year old, so maybe she didn't realize where the pain was. But multifocal bony LCH can present like this. And then rare cases of isolated or multi-system disease that progresses to the lungs. This is almost exclusively seen in smokers. And unfortunately, um, especially in uh, Western societies, but I suspect even in India nowadays, um, young people are smoking things besides cigarettes. So this is the CT scan of a 17 year old who swore that he does not smoke cigarettes. And um, Later on, when I asked him, yes, he was smoking marijuana. And um, you know, as you can see, his lungs look like somebody took a gun and poked all these holes in them. And uh, he developed several episodes of pneumothorax requiring chest tubes. Um, and usually, if you tell them to stop smoking, it goes away. This is why the risk organ uh, classification is important. This is the survival curve of several patients who were collectively um, treated in the histiocyte society studies. And this is the survival. So if there is no risk organ involvement, the survival is 
if there's only spleen involvement, it drops down to 90%. If it's only liver, 80%. The hematopoietic system only is involved. We're talking survival now drops down to 70%. But if you have more than one risk organ involved, now we're talking survival is only 50%. So it is important to know if there is a risk organ involvement. The current treatments for LCH consist of chemotherapy with the, the standard um, uh, treatments based off of the Histiocyte Society trials consisting of vinblastin, prednisone, with or without 6-MP. Our colleagues at Texas Children's Hospital have also used cytarabine or RSC as a single agent. Either of these two regimens are delivered every three to four weeks for 12 months. And as you can imagine, these are associated with immune suppression and some other side effects of steroids. Um, and I want to share with you the data from the LCH3 clinical trial, which was the last international trial carried out by the Histiocyte Society, which used vinblastin and prednisone with 6-MP if you had risk organ involvement and without 6-MP if there was no risk organ. So this is the survival curve of children um, who had risk organ involvement, and they were treated with the vinblastin plus prednisone, and they were randomized to receive uh, an additional uh, drug, methotrexate. And the survival was no different between whether you received methotrexate or not. There's one challenge, though. This survival curve shows that 85% of the patients survived. This is only of those who completed the first six weeks of therapy. There were additional 15% of children who actually died in the first six weeks. So in reality, the survival is actually 70%, not 85%. But if you read the paper, this is the curve that you see that shows 85%. So already, we're actually talking a mortality of not 13 to 18%, but actually 30% upfront. And then some other children died later on after the first six weeks. The bigger challenge is that of those who survived, 30% of them go on to develop reactivations of the disease. And that was regardless of whether they got methotrexate or just been blasted in prednisone. So if you combine the 30% uh, recurrence and um, those patients who did not survive, we're talking close to 50% treatment failure for vinblastin prednisone. This is the basis of the current trial, LCH4, that is ongoing. In the patients who received, who had a low risk or non-risk organ multi-system disease, they were randomized to receive either six months of vinblastin prednisone or 12 months of vinblastin prednisone. What I'm showing you that although they all survived, they also had a 13% upfront failure. So six, uh, after the initial six weeks of therapies, 13% of patients had no response or they progressed. Of the remaining, those who got six months of therapy, 50% of them had a reactivation. And those who got 12 months of therapy, 37% of them had a reactivation. So if you take the average about, even if, or even if you take the best, 37% plus the 13% who had failure. Again, we're talking about 45% treatment failure if you did not have a risk organ involved. So let's go back to our patients. So the 12-year-old girl who had a mass uh, on the left side of her eye and then one in the coccyx, she was treated with one year of vinblastin prednisone. And three months after she completed that, she came back complaining of back pain. And this is her PET scan from that. And she had multiple lesions in her ribs. There was another one in her pelvis, another one in her skull this time. And uh, these are the cross-sectional views of the same PET scan. So there's the skull lesion and here's the pelvic lesion, the same one that is shown here. And so for patients who relapse um, after having completed vinblastin and prednisone, the current um, salvage therapy options available are these two agents, clofarbine or cladribine. And there has been a clinical trial uh, conducted by the Histiocyte Society for cladribine. And clofarbine has just completed a clinical trial in North America by the consortium called NACHO, which is the North American Consortium for Histiocytic Disorders. Um, they enrolled 20 patients who had relapsed, and the response rates reported are 80% uh, 
but they are actually mostly for patients uh, who had multifocal risk um, uh, bony disease that was risk organ negative. When we have used clofarabine, we did see responses in some patients, again, only those who had risk organ negative disease. Clofarabine comes with significant toxicities of uh, cytopenias, severe GI toxicity. Cladribine is similar with several cytopenias. We even had one patient develop secondary AML after receiving cladribine. Um, and that AML was with monosomy 7, so very high-risk AML. And he recently underwent bone marrow transplant and fortunately is doing okay. But you can imagine you survive LCH only to get AML. And so that 11-year-old gold was treated with clofarabine. Um, she did have horrible side effects. Unfortunately, six months later, she had another bony lesion. The infants that I showed you earlier, the first four um, uh, of the first four infants patients, infants one and two, the first one who was sent to us, who had no responsive in blast and prednisone, we treated her with clofarabine. And the second infant was treated with clofarabine elsewhere. They had no response to that. And so in these infants, they were sent to us should we do bone marrow transplant in them? We tried that 20 years ago and majority of those children actually died. So what do you do about those children then? Well, now we know that almost all of histiocytic disorders, not just LCH, are driven by activations, activating mutations in this biological pathway called the MAP kinase pathway. And majority of patients have mutations in this node here. The gene is called BRAF. BRAF activates an enzyme called MEC, and we have found a majority of patients to have mutations in BRAF. The most common mutation is this one called BRAF V600E, where at amino acid position 600, the amino acid valine is replaced by glutamine, which causes a spontaneous or constitutive activated state of this uh, serine threonine kinase. And this is the same mutation that is found in melanoma, papillary thyroid cancer, hairy cell leukemia, some fraction of lung and colon cancers as well. So based on this, we can now safely say that LCH is a neoplasm. I do not like to use the word cancer because there are many other features of cancer that LCH does not have. Particularly, this is the only single mutation. Most cancers have multiple other mutations. Um, but uh, the, we prefer to call it neoplasm similar to the myeloproliferative neoplasms like polycythemia vera or essential thrombocytemia. Cytemia. The difference being that instead of a tyrosine kinase, this is a serine threonine kinase. And this neoplasm is more inflammatory and less proliferative. Hence the inflammatory. So I prefer to call it an inflammatory neoplasm of the myeloid lineage. Fortunately, there are inhibitors of all of these activating uh, activated genes available, all approved by the FDA in the US um, for melanoma, some approved for lung cancer and colon cancer. So the BRAF inhibitors, some of you may be familiar with them, are vemirafenib, dabrafenib, and the latest one is encorafenib. The MEK inhibitors available are cobimetinib, trametinib, and binimetinib. And like I said, all these are FDA approved. The question was, will these drugs treat LCH? They have never been tried in children. Are they safe to use in children? So recall the first page, he also had a skin rash. He was treated with emblastin prednisone relapsed on therapy. He was then treated with clofarabine as second line and his skin and bone disease responded, but um, his liver, he, we also found him to have liver disease, but that persisted no matter what treatment we gave him. And then when we uh, looked at his biopsy, he was found to have the BRAF V600E mutation. And this was the first patient whom I asked this question, can we use a BRAF inhibitor? And so the big question was, well, everything else, the skin and bones have responded to clofarabine. Is it possible that this thing going on in his liver is actually not LCH, a different condition, which is why it has not responded. So we did a liver biopsy. And uh, if you recall, I told you the CD1A stain is how you make the diagnosis. This is actually the CD1A stain of his, and it should be brown when it is positive. And there is not a single CD1A positive cell. His liver architecture is quite distorted. And so the pathology report said that this is not LCH. 
And so maybe Clofarib being treated as LCH. But since we now had discovered that he had the BRAF V600 mutation, just as we were making this diagnosis, at that stage, it was only a research, uh, but now it is clinically available. There's an immunostain specifically for the BRAF V600E protein that can distinguish the wild type or normal BRAF from the mutant BRAF. So we applied that stain to his liver biopsy. And that is the brown cells. And you can see that he has several cells in his liver that stain positive for the BRAF V600E mutation. We have subsequently identified several patients in whom the uh, uh, LCH cells are CD1A negative in the liver and in the bone marrow, but elsewhere they retain CD1A. So CD1A no longer can be considered absolutely essential to make the diagnosis, especially if you have the BRAF V600E. So we initiated treatment with Dabrafenib, and his, he had by then relapsed with ex additional bony lesions, and those resolved. For the first time, his liver enzymes normalized. Unfortunately, by this time, and if you stare hard at this PET scan, you can see there's nodularity in his liver. So he had already developed cirrhosis, but it is stable. And for the first time in 18 months, his PET scan is completely normal. He is now five years since this diagnosis. And in spite of having cirrhosis, which is actually completely compensated and stable, he's thriving like any other child. Remember these four infants that I showed you, uh, they all, the first two, these came to us in chronological order. Uh, these two had been treated with the vinblastin, prednisone, clofarabine. This one actually had been treated with clofarabine plus cytarabine, had under, even undergone a splenectomy to try and improve his blood cell counts, but nothing worked. Um, um, she, the first infant was found to have the BRAF V600 e mutation. We put her on treatment with the dabrafenib, the BRAF inhibitor. And this was her response. Um, so uh, this is her platelet count, if you recall, it was in single digits. This is where dabrafenib was initiated in about 10 days, the platelet count started to rise and became normal. This is a soluble alter receptor, which was 15,000. It dropped within 48 hours of initiating dabrafenib. She is now, uh, this was um, initiated, treatment was initiated in her four years ago. She's in complete clinical remission. She's thriving, has uh, uh, received all her immunizations. However, if you do a bone marrow biopsy, it looks morphologically normal, but if you apply the BRAF V600E stain, you can still find five to 10% of her bone marrow showing BRAF V600E positive cells. So she remains on therapy with dabrafenib. It's an oral pill that she takes twice a day, but is otherwise thriving and doing quite well. This was the third infant. As you can see, she had this massively enlarged and bright thymus, and two months after dabrafenib, the thymus is completely normalized. All these lymph nodes and bony lesions have completely disappeared. Recall the adult woman who had LCH, um, the one who had these uh, lesions in her neck and her groin. These were biopsied. It found to be LCH, but she and she was found to have a BRAF mutation, but it was a different mutation, something that we had never seen before, something that has never been described in the literature at that time. And so the question was, can we treat her with a BRAF inhibitor? Well, we did not even know if this was an activating mutation in the first place. So fortunately, having a research lab puts you in the position to study this. So one of my fellows actually was able to clone this and express it in um, a cell line. And so I'm showing you a Western blot of uh, the downstream gene um, phosphor. We're looking at phosphorylation of the enzyme ERK. And so if these cells that express wild type BRAF, there's a, a looking at the intensity of this band in the middle. If you add a growth factor like EGF, now you see uh, you, uh, you get excessive phosphorylation. So BRAF responds to EGF. The mutant BRAF without EGF shows the same level of activation. So it is spontaneously active, constitutively active, which makes sense. The question was, will a BRAF inhibitor like dabrafenib or vemurafenib blocks, the, will it block it? Again, um, I did not know the answer. So I went to one of my colleagues who is a protein chemist and who modeled this mutation for us. And I'm going to show you the crystal structure of the BRAF protein, which was modeled by my colleague, Nicholas Nasser. And uh, if you follow the, uh, my laser pointer, the V600E mutation lies somewhere here. This is amino acid 600. When you replace the valine with the glutamine, it causes this P-loop to move inwards. 
And that is what leads to the activation of uh, BRAF. This is yellow ring structure here is vemurafenib and vemurafenib blocks, it causes steric hindrance, uh, preventing the movement of this loop towards the other side. This is how it blocks the activation of BRAF. Our patient's deletion is all the way up here. And if you remove these five amino acids, you automatically bring this part of the protein closer to the other side. This is called the A loop, and this is the C loop. It brings those two closer. You can have all the vemurafenib or devrapenib down here. It is not going to prevent or block this movement. So we knew that vemurafenib or devrapenib were not going to work. But since we know that BRAF activates MEC and MEC then activates ERK, and there are MEC inhibitors available. So the question was, should we try a MEC inhibitor instead? And so that is what we did. And we called, this is her PET scan uh, with these masses in her neck. And so we put her on MET treatment with trametinib, which is a MEC inhibitor. And six weeks later, those masses have completely disappeared. And in fact, her sister is the one who called us five days after we initiated her trametinib saying those masses had disappeared. And we did not believe it until we saw the PET scan. And so now that we know that MEC inhibitors work, the question is why not just use a MEC inhibitor in everybody? Then you don't have to worry about what the uh, activating mutation is. And so this is what we have been doing now in our experience so far. We have now treated close to 40 patients uh, starting in 2016. Majority of them have had LCH, but we have also treated patients with the juvenile xanthogranuloma, JXG, which is the cousin of LCH. They all, uh, majority of them have the BRAF V600D mutation, but several others like the adult patient I just showed you had different mutations. We initially started treating patients with dabrafenib, but more recently we have switched to the MEK inhibitor trametinib. Every single patient has had a complete clinical response. And so the question is, are these inhibitors safe? If you read the literature of adults who have melanoma, you will find that they develop uh, fevers, rash, secondary skin cancers, reduced ejection fraction of the heart. In our cohort so far, no patient has had fevers. The adult patient did have rash with trametinib that resolved after dose reduction. Um, I know that uh, there is one child who I'm remotely treating actually um, with the help of Dr. Neetha Radhakrishnan in, in Delhi. And uh, that is a nine-year-old child. He has recently developed um, a mild skin rash on trametinib, but he's the first child in whom we have seen that. And I don't know for sure if that is related to trametinib. We did have one child who had some hair thinning, um, but that was about it. We have not seen any secondary skin cancers. The long-term safety, of course, is unknown. The duration of therapy remains undefined. But I, my proposal is that I think we have been thinking of LCH, um, we, well, we need to think of LCH differently. If we think of LCH as a myeloinflammatory neoplasm-like chronic phase CML or uh, polycythemia, then perhaps these patients need prolonged therapy and maybe some of them can come off treatment, but maybe some of them may require lifelong treatment with these inhibitors. But as long as they are safe um, and don't cause any side effects, um, maybe that is the way to go, but only time will tell. We don't have data on that quite yet. So I will leave you with the last example. This was a three month old boy who developed this full body skin rash. He was actually born with the rash, I would, uh, the mother thinks. Uh, the father thinks the body rash started later, but he had a scalp rash noted at birth. He then developed fever and stopped uh, eating and drinking at right around one month of age, then developed diarrhea and vomiting, was found to be in pancytopenia, had hyperbilirubinemia, a biopsy of the skin was taken, and of course it is LCH. A PET scan showed he had diffuse FDG uptake throughout the skeleton, and he was the one uh, I mentioned initially that he had uh, uptake throughout his intestines, as you can see here is his descending colon lights up brightly and also had patchy uptake in his liver. And so he was found to have BRAF V600E as well. We initiated trametinib. It's once given uh, once daily orally. So we had placed an NG tube and just started dripping it down that uh, nasogastric tube. This is him two weeks after trametinib. As you can see, the skin rash is starting to resolve. Uh, he became afebrile, the vomiting and diarrhea resolved. Um, he was on 
he was TPN dependent. This is his pick line in his left arm. Uh, his blood count started to recover. His bilirubin started to decline. Four weeks later, this is what he looks like. All of his lab abnormalities has resolved. He's gaining weight, looks like a normal infant now. His PET scan is completely normal. At this age, we finally performed a bone marrow biopsy and sure enough, he still has a residual BRAF V600D. And he just celebrated his first birthday he, eight months later. He remains on trametinib. He's thriving. He's fully immunized. And his family just sent me this uh, picture when he turned one year old. So even in this very young infant, we were able to skip chemotherapy, go directly to a MEK inhibitor, and he's doing quite well. Um, I will give you one last example of this rare entity that we still don't know what this is, but um, I will just share the data with you. A four-year-old boy developed sudden onset polyuria polydipsia, and he was found to have central diabetes insipidus. An MRI shows a thickened pituitary stalk, which I've highlighted here with this yellow arrow. There was nothing else. There was no evidence of LCH. The question was, is this LCH or is this a germ cell tumor? Because that is the other thing that can cause central diabetes insipidus. An LP was performed. He was negative for CSF tumor markers. We did a PET scan, completely negative. The bone marrow was normal. There was no evidence of BRAF B600E. Should we observe or, or intervene? And if intervene, with what? So we chose to observe and not do anything. A few weeks later, he developed headaches, and the MRI shows that that pituitary stock thickening had actually increased. And so since we had nothing else to go by, we initiated trametinib. And three months later, we repeated the MRI and the pituitary mass is completely gone. Now the diabetes insipidus persists. We know that, that once you develop that, that is irreversible. And he has not developed any toxicities on trametinib. This was now almost two years ago. And the question is, how long do we need to treat him? And honestly, we don't know. Based on our experience, uh, these patients are at risk for developing neurodegenerative disease of the brain. And if our goal is to prevent that, since we, uh, that is horrible and irreversible, at least for now, we are keeping him on treatment as long as he does not have any side effects. And so these are our current challenges. These inhibitors are not FDA approved in children. Uh, Novartis, the manufacturer has been generous with us that for each child, I have to apply to them and show them that, look, I do believe they have LCH and I do believe that they will benefit from trametinib. So then they give free drug to the families. Unfortunately, they are not interested in a clinical trial. Like I said, we don't know the duration of therapy, several years, perhaps lifelong. I have had to argue with physicians who are unwilling to try this therapy because they say that you have to exhaust all chemotherapy options. And my argument is, why do we have to make these children suffer more when we have, uh, and especially when, if you recall, the LCH clinical trial from the Histocyte Society shows that 50% of patients will relapse. Why do we need to put children through that suffering when we have this novel therapy available that works? So I will leave you with this summary that these disorders, like I said, I consider them to be inflammatory myeloid neoplasms. Most of them are now, we know are associated with activating mutations in the MAP kinase pathway. Most of them respond very well to MEK inhibitors. I have made, uh, I have made some headway. I'm hoping that there's a small company called Springworks that has a new MEK inhibitor called Murdametinib, and they are interested in the clinical trial. I am currently in negotiations with them, and hopefully we will have a clinical trial coming soon. Um, and that will then open up the availability of these drugs easily for all patients. With that, I will end here, and thank you very much for inviting me, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ashish. I think it was uh, really a very lucid, very nicely covered and uh, uh, quite uh, interesting to see the newer developments, uh, especially in the target therapy field. So we have some questions and I'll request others to please keep posting. And uh, uh, one, there are two questions, uh, basically from the diagnosis point of view, from the diagnostic uh, 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 workup point of view. Um, first of all, is on PET scan. You know, I think PET scan you showed on each and every patient which you uh, uh, which you are also highlighted. So I think there was a question on PET scan. You know, do you think this is to be done for every patient at evaluation in LCH now? And the second so, question yeah, uh, on the diagnosis was on the 
Um, on the staining, I think you showed a couple of cases where CD1A was lost, but you could uh, still uh, you know, demonstrate a persistent disease um, on, the, on the immunostains for BRAF. Uh, what, what do you think that has got implications both in, in, in the context of diagnosis as well as in the context of response evaluation? So these are the two questions on the diagnostic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the PET scan question, um, it depends on what uh, type of disease you suspect. So like I said, majority of children will have an isolated bony lesion, but you know, you, skeletal surveys in our experience are not as sensitive as PET scans. And especially when it comes to uh, assessing response to therapy, um, the holes in the bones will persist on x-rays for much longer, but the PET activity goes away much quicker. And so if you're going to use um, a chemotherapy, and if you're going to assess the response in six weeks based on x-ray, the x-rays will show that the lesions are persisting, or the CT scan will show the lesion is persisting with some sclerosis. And then you're left wondering, is the patient responding or not responding? But if the PET activity is going away, then you know for sure that your treatment is working. Now, if you have um, if you already have multi-system or multifocal bone disease, and you know that you've already made the diagnosis, if you have some other way of assessing response, especially if risk organ is involved, such as a liver or the bone marrow, um, there a PET scan is less useful because uh, you know if you start treatment and the skull or the other bony lesions respond, but the liver or, or blood count is not responding, who cares? Uh, the risk organs are what you need to see the response in. So we have PET scan easily available um, most everybody in the U.S. is covered by health insurance, so cost is not a factor for not that critical of a factor. We still have to argue many times with insurance companies. So we do perform PET scans in everybody, but you know you can make this decision on a case by case basis. You don't have to have a PET scan in everybody, but if you're dealing with multifocal bone disease, then if possible, a PET scan can be used at least initially to assess response. Now, as far as the BRAF stain, yes, you're absolutely right. This is this came as a complete surprise to us as well that the CD1A stain is not expressed by LCH cells when they're in the bone marrow or in the liver. So any child who has pancytopenia or any cytopenia with LCH, if you do the CD1A stain in the bone marrow, it will always be negative. And the pathology report is, will say that there's no LCH involvement. So our hematopathologists uh, also learned this when I told them, can you please do the BRAF stain? And sure enough, it's everywhere. So based on that, we are now um, revising actually the um, pathology literature. So we are going to alert the pathologists that you can't, at least in the bone marrow and the liver, you cannot go by just the absence of CD1A. Now the challenge is that only 50 to 60% of patients will have the BRAF V600E mutation and the immunostain detects only that protein. There are other BRAF mutations, there are MEK mutations. And for those, we don't have the immunostain yet. The a good thing is that almost all the bone marrow involving patients have the V600E mutation. So it's, uh, so far it is working. What uh, Dr. Jennifer Pekarsik, our pathologist, what she's working on is developing an immunostain for the activated ERK, which is the downstream of MEK. So regardless of which mutation you have, if you find activated ERK or phosphorylated ERK, that means you can say that the MAP kinase is active, doesn't matter which the mutation is. So if we start using that, then perhaps CD1A becomes less essential. But we have to be very careful because if you take away the CD1A stain, the rest of the features of histiocytes and eosinophils can be seen in many, uh, not many, but a few other conditions that can be misdiagnosed as LCH, uh, at least in the Western cultures, Western world, atypical mycobacterial infections have been misdiagnosed as LCH. So uh, we do need to, especially in bony lesions or lymph nodes, the CD1A stain remains uh, an essential marker. Thank you, Dr. Ishi. That's helpful. But I, just as a continuation of uh, you know, what we're discussing uh, now, um, there are a couple of comments and questions in the chat box. What about S100 and what about Langren? Um, you know, uh, in context, yes. the so, same, you know. Right, right. So S100 is useful, but uh, you know, the number S100 tells you that there are 100 conditions in which you can find it. So it is not very specific. Langren is specific. 
However, uh, we have seen uh, just, just like uh, the CD1A in the bone marrow and in the liver, sometimes Langren is not, uh, uh, not always positive. But if it is positive, then yes, it definitely helps. If it's negative, we have to be careful. Sometimes the, uh, the differentiation stage, you know, so it may not be LCH, but it may be JXG. So, you, you know, um, so if it is positive, absolutely it works. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Ashish. I think uh, uh, next, going on to the response evaluation, ref response assessment. Um, so there's a question on that, and that's on the response assessment in the lungs, when the lung is the uh, is the affected organ. And sometimes you you know see these bad ones with a lot of air leaks and a lot of yeah. chemical destruction. So yeah. how do we assess uh, responses in those, which is quite difficult. Yeah, sometimes. so uh, we have started using um, just regular CT scans for lung disease. And uh, like I said, uh, um, most patients, if they stop smoking, it gets better. But uh, I will, I did not show you. I recently have had a patient who, in whom we treated him with trametinib and he has had a dramatic response. Um, within three months when we repeated the CT scan, the lytic, the number of lesions have significantly reduced and the ones that are left have become very small. Unfortunately, he has continued to smoke in spite of my telling him he needs to give it up. Uh, but uh, trametinib has worked. And my biggest worry is that he's going to now think, huh, I can keep smoking because my medication is working. But a CT scan is good enough for lung disease. You don't need to do a PET scan, in my opinion, for that one. Yeah, so thank you. And a uh, uh, few questions on the treatment, uh, Dr. Ashish. Uh, uh, one is... Uh, I think we'll go to uh, go with uh, the question which was posed, I think, by Dr. Venkat on lenalidomide. So we have yeah. some data from Dr. Ravi's group as well here, and there's also in right. study a plan on that. So your experiences yep. with that, because it's kind of uh, you know a little cheaper available here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that. I have not used lenalidomide in LCH. Uh, in fact, um, I came across <laughs> Dr. Ravi's paper because I ended. I had to use it in a different disease, a different histiocytic disorder, Rosai Dorfman disease. We had a, a young adult who had very refractory Rosai Dorfman, and we used the combination of lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And she has now completed three cycles, and her disease has responded. We have not used it in LCH simply because. We have the BRAF and MEK inhibitors available. Um, but if you are seeing responses, then absolutely. The question, of course, is going to be the same one. Um, how long can you keep a patient on lenalidomide and dexamethasone? Can you use lenalidomide as a single agent? Um, and how long can you keep the patient on that? Um, because the challenge is that as soon as you stop it, my worry is that the disease will relapse. Unless if you think you're able to eliminate the disease-initiating cell with lenalidomide, um, and it, it may be possible. I mean, there are 50% of patients who do have a sustained response to the vinblast and prednisone option. So in some patients, it does go away. The challenge is being able to predict upfront who that patient is going to be in whom you can eliminate the disease. We currently don't have any way to predict that. So short of that, I think it's definitely worth trying. I have unfortunately don't have experience it outside of that Rosai Dorfman patient. Yeah, so um, thank you. Um, another question was on what's the choice of intralesional steroid, you know, in a, in a single site when you're doing intralesional steroid, what yeah. do you use in your practice and what do you recommend? Yeah. yeah, so hydrocortisone is what our surgeons use. And I have now um, recommended against doing anything, any such intralesional therapies. If it's a single lesion, just do a biopsy, leave it alone, it'll go away on its own. Um, but um, hydrocortisone is what our, our surgeons have used. Thank you. Um, now, a few questions on the targeted therapy. I think that's been uh, probably one of the most discussed topics. Um, uh, you know, there are th two, three components to Dr. Ashish, so I'll just mention all of them. You can take it all together. Uh, one is, um, uh, you know, on the, I think you used this on a couple of patients which, which you showed frontline, correct? Um, so, you know, why do you see this as a frontline therapy? Because as you yourself mentioned, you know, 60, 70% times we probably can get away with um, with, with our, our routine chemotherapy. So uh, do you still see there's a role in, in this as a frontline in, and that especially absence of uh, good data, multi-center data, long-term data, that is number one. And uh, number two is that, um, uh, for example, MEK inhibitor you have used uh, in the patients and you know there was a question uh, on, um, is there a concern of uh, second malignancies, clonal evolutions um, you know, in the long-term use? And third, you know, even when there's a clinical trial, data is out, uh, 
you know cost economics is going to be concerned so uh, and as you, you yourself said it's going to be a, 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 a long term if not lifelong treatment so how do we address that concern yeah yeah so uh, the, the first question of uh, uh, frontline therapy yes uh, we have now treated 12 patients uh, with the mech inhibitors frontline therapy and the you know, for infant who in the infant who has a multi-system um, risk organ disease, there the answer is very simple. They are the ones who don't respond to chemotherapy. So all the patients who died in the LCH three clinical trial, majority of them were infants who had multi-system risk organ disease. And as the infants that I showed you, the, um, you know, the four infants that I showed you, the first two had uh, progressed in spite of all chemotherapy options. So in those patients, um, I would argue that uh, the data are very clear. Chemotherapy is not going to work in majority of them, or even if it works initially temporarily, you cannot predict who of them is going to then relapse. And as, you, as I showed you one example, we now have two infants who by the time they got to actually now four infants, I take it back, who by the time we got them to targeted therapy had already initiated development of cirrhosis. One of them developed then uh, horrible esophageal uh, variceal bleeding and had to have an emergency liver transplant. The fourth child is currently awaiting liver transplant uh, because his disease progressed and it was initially treated with chemotherapy. So for infants with risk organ disease, in my opinion, there is no there is no indication for chemotherapy anymore. It does not work. Of all the other children who have risk organ disease, 10% will develop central diabetes insipidus, which is irreversible and lifelong. Of those who develop diabetes insipidus, uh, 25 to 40% of them will go on to develop neurodegenerative disease. And upfront, since we cannot predict which patient is going to develop DI, which patient is going to respond, and even if you don't develop DI, there's a 40 to 50% chance of recurrence. And since we cannot predict who is going to develop recurrence, I share all of these data upfront with the families who come to me. And I tell them, we have two choices, either try this chemotherapy, which we know is one year and 50%, maybe 60%, depending on which type of disease you have, uh, will go away into complete clinical remission. Um, we cannot predict which ones they are, but that is true. 50 to 60% will go away. And uh, vinblastin and prednisone is actually not that difficult to tolerate. Uh, the side effects are minimal. Yes, steroids do have the weight gain and all of that, but it's, it's minimal. And then this uh, alternative is to use trametinib, which is now our go-to drug, where it is once a day oral medication. There is a chance that your child may have to take this for the rest of their life. Every single family has opted for trametinib. Nobody wants the chemotherapy option except one family. And that one family, both parents are doctors. They chose chemotherapy for their child. Everyone else chose trametinib, even though the data I told them are quite limited. But we, I let the parents decide. Uh, you know, we have now moved to this option of a shared decision-making process uh, because we have to be upfront with them. If I tell them that this is the chemotherapy, this is what we normally treated with, I would be lying because that chemotherapy treatment option is not, it's not very, very, it's not as good as we think it should be. So based on that, we have now treated 12, like I said, 12 patients with upfront therapy. And you saw the infant, the three month old, what a dramatic response he has had. Now, as far as second malignancies, uh, like I said, we have now, my oh, the first patient has been on Dabrafenib now for almost six years. Uh, the second malignancy in skin cancer in melanoma patients, this is where the biology comes into play, that those melanocytes and epithelial, well, what they develop are secondary squamous cancers, um, not uh, melanoma. And that's because the skin cells already had additional mutations, such as P53 deletion or activating mutations in mTOR, other molecular pathways. And if you block the MAP kinase pathways, there was a pressure or selection pressure. They developed uh, other mutations, and that's how they, they developed skin cancers. Or the, uh, uh, if you block just the BRAF, there is a... a um, the, the uh, dabrafenib particularly has this uh, uh, paradoxical effect that it causes dimerization of uh, the normal BRAF, because if you think about it in the cell, only one of the BRAF genes has the V600 mutation. The normal residual wild type BRAF 
the, is, uh, is activated. The brafinib actually stimulates the dimerization of BRAF with CRAF. And that then activates the MAP kinase pathway, which then leads to the react, uh, basically leading in the same situation. We don't see that in LCH, mainly because, like I said, first of all, LCH is not a malignancy. It has a single kinase mutation, which is why we have not seen that. And I don't think we will see, but like I said, time will tell. But in the five years, um, the, the longest patient who's been on it for six years, this infants that I've showed you, three of them have been on debrafenib now for five years, and none of them have developed a secondary malignancy. So I don't think that is a concern. Our initial concern was neurodevelopment, uh, because in animal models, if you remove or block the any portions of the MAP kinase pathway, there are uh, challenge problems with brain development. We have not seen that with any of our patients. Uh, many of them are now, um, you know, the first infant, I started treating him and when he was a year and a half, and now he's in uh, <clears throat> second uh, standard at school. And if you see him, he looks just like any other normal child. He's doing very well in school. So we have not seen any of those side effects either. Uh, yes, the long-term side effects remain unknown, but at this stage, we have not seen that. Now the cost, yes, upfront, the medication is expensive. But if you compare that to the cost of recurrence after recurrence after years of chemotherapy and you're left with diabetes insipidus that is irreversible or cirrhosis for which you have to do a liver transplant, I think the cost of the medication will end up being less uh, as of now. But I think which is why we need to convince these drug companies that, uh, look, we are this market is there for you. Um, you just need to figure out the cost analysis. I, I don't want to minimize the impact of the cost of the medication. Yes, it is definitely there, uh, but hopefully compared to the hundreds of thousands of patients with adults with melanoma and lung cancer um, who are using the same medication, hopefully we can convince the drug companies that you can make your profit off of those patients. And for children, maybe they can give the drug for a lower cost or for this indication, because the number of patients with LCH are minuscule compared to those with lung cancer or melanoma. Now, of course, as pediatric oncologists, um, our numbers are different than what, you know, to us, we think if you come to my clinic, people would think that LCH is the most common most common neoplasm, but that is not the case, okay? So, so yes, the cost is a question and hopefully um, as time goes on, as, the, uh, as we collect more data, as we publish more data, um, as the trials are conducted, hopefully we can convince the companies to reduce the cost. Um, now, uh, I know we can go on and on, uh, Dr. Ashish. I will just conclude probably with two more questions and then I, you know, ma'am can conclude the session. Um, two questions. One is, is there still some role of stem cell transplant in refractory disease? And uh, mm. number two is, uh, uh, have you seen breakthroughs, you know, a, a BRAF uh, inhibitor introduced in response and then loss of response after that, once it has yeah. been introduced? Yeah. yeah. So we don't use stem cell transplant because if you can stay on trametinib and you have such a wonderful life, why would you want to try and fix that? So we have not done transplant. Uh, there have been uh, two children transplanted in Europe after remission was induced with the debrafenib. And one of them was published in Blood, I think 2018 or 2019 as a case report. And another one was published somewhere else. Uh, but even the Europeans have now, um, they are doing the same thing that we are doing, putting patients on uh, prolonged therapy for many years. So no, um, that is not the case. So far, we have not seen breakthrough. There was one child who on debrafenib, uh, actually, I will tell you two stories. One child with debrafenib uh, on a screening was found to have a lytic bony lesion, and we thought he had relapsed. But when we biopsied it, it turns out he had a, uh, a an, an infection. We could never figure out what the infection was, and it went away on its own. So it was not a relapse of LCH. I had uh, an infant who developed uh, severe neutropenia. His neutrophil count dropped down to zero, and he was on, he's on trametinib. And uh, I could not explain why that happened. Um, and we looked in his bone marrow. Sure, he had BRAF positive, a few residual cells, but basically he's an infant 
he had a cold before that and then developed autoimmune neutropenia, which is a normal thing of childhood. So, but none of our patients so far, like I said, our experience is now close to 40 patients as long as they are on treatment. Uh, one child, uh, we, dis we stopped dabrafenib for a few months because we thought that she was cured uh, and then she relapsed with diabetes insipidus. So as long as they stay on therapy, no one has developed a breakthrough. So I don't think that has happened yet. Uh, now, like I said, our experience is limited to six years. Maybe in the next four to 10 years, maybe we will see relapses. I don't know, that remains to be seen. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ashish. I think it's been a wonderful session. So we, you know, again, we, we appreciate your time and we appreciate- the pleasure was time. mine. Um, I, I would request um, Dr. Mamda Mangalani, ma'am, if you could please come to the session and, um, you know, um, um, uh, and then we can let Dr. Ashish have a little bit of rest now. <laughs> Ma'am, you could unmute yourself. Uh, uh, Ria, can we unmute uh, doc, uh, every, I mean, uh, ma'am, or everyone you can unmute, it's okay. Yeah, you can, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, I was wondering how to communicate. I put in the chat that someone has to unmute me. <laughs> it's difficult in the virtual uh, world. Uh, so thank you, uh, Ashish. It was wonderful listening to you. You know, roles reverse in life. Uh, you are a teacher to me now. And I really enjoyed it. It was very lucid talk with so much experience behind it, uh, with so much of uh, data available to you and so much knowledge from literature that you put forth for us to learn. Uh, I think I'm very excited understanding the targeted therapy in LCH today uh, better than before. And uh, secondly, I'm uh, happy to know that with your experience of five years, you are happy with this treatment because even in other cancers now, targeted therapies are replacing chemotherapy, radiotherapy, which have horrible toxicities, you know, uh, which cause more trouble than good to the patient finally, just taking away the cancer, but then leaving them with a very poor quality of life. So learned a lot. Uh, I'm happy that I managed to attend today because sometimes I do bunk. So Neil knows about it. But today I decided that because you were speaking, I must attend. So enjoy it and thank you for sparing time. Thank you for taking out early morning time for us. And please keep connecting with us. We will keep troubling you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you participants for being there. Thank you very much and have a good evening, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Neeta.